Okay, Jesse, last week's unredeemable granny was pretty wild. What's the story this time around? When a couple on the brink of divorce takes a family trip, a fatal tragedy occurs. But was it a terrible accident or something far more sinister? I'm Andy Cassette. And I'm Jesse Prey, and this is Love Murder. Hi, Andy. Hi, Jesse. Welcome back, everyone, to Love Murder, a podcast about crazy situations, wilder intentions, and love gone fatally wrong. You can find Love Murder on TikTok and Instagram at Love Murder Pod and on Facebook by searching Love Murder Podcast. If you enjoy this show, pretty please love slash murder a five star rating on your podcast app. Subscribe and review to help new people discover the show. Thanks, as always, for your lovely reviews this week. Also, if you're interested in supporting the show more directly, head on over to patreon.com slash lovemurderpod, where you can learn all about the different tiers of support. Speaking of Patreon, we're so excited as always this week to welcome and shout out a new set of wonderful patrons. Welcome to Olive H., Madison L. and Jasmine A., Gilla M. and Calvet S., Kathy K. and Carlene M., Mariah C. and Christian V. F., And finally, Allie T and Jennifer H. So I have something I'm kind of cooking up, Andy, for the $3 part of the club level. I think it would be really fun to have a Love Murder book club. So fun. Yeah. I was just like looking around. There was a book I wanted to get, actually, a thriller that's not being released until August. And apparently, if you're in a book club, you can get advanced copies. That's so cool. Which is super cool. So I was like, why don't we have a book club? So. I think that it would be really fun if we did that on like the lowest tier, the part of the club, because it's part of the Love Murder Club, but also part of the book club. And then we'll maybe pick like a true crime book or a thriller every month. And I can even add the books that I read here if anyone wants to have conversations about them as well. So I'm going to start figuring that out and we'll be rolling out the book club soon as the part of the uh, lowest level ad free shout out tier of the Patreon. Yeah, that sounds very exciting as long as we can have some of our cheesy thrillers in there. Of course. I love nothing more than a good airport thriller. So (laughs) we'll have some great beach reads coming up. I love this season now. We get all those juicy thrillers and kind of flirty fun beach reads. We will be talking about a family vacation, and I'm sure many of you are coming back from family vacations because this will be coming out on the Wednesday after Memorial Day weekend. This trip was decidedly not fun and flirty, so let's get into it. All right, yeah, let's pack up in that minivan, Jess. (laughs) A trip to the inn at Watervale had always been a happy occasion for the Unger family. It was located on Lower Herring Lake, a small lake in northwest Michigan, a favorite among kayakers, paddleboarders, and all types of water sports enthusiasts. The inn was actually more of a collection of cottages with a couple of main houses and a boathouse with a shared deck. Family-owned, Watervale's cabins were split between couple Linnaeus and Maggie Duncan, Linnaeus went by Lynn, and Maggie's cousin Dory. The Duncans had been running the inn for years and were mainstays in the small town as well as a welcoming beacon to the scores of regular guests who returned year after year. One such family was the Ungers, Mark and Florence, who went by Flo, and their two young sons. Lynn and Maggie were always happy to see the Ungers. They had watched the family grow before their eyes, the children going from babies to toddlers to running and jumping boys, gleefully playing with their dog. Flo and Mark had grown as well. The once loved up kids in their early 20s had morphed into early middle age with kids and jobs and stress in life. 37-year-old Flo looked just like she had in her 20s, however. Still a head-turner wherever she went, Flo had always relied on pretty strenuous exercise regimen to keep her looking and feeling her best. Lots of people talked about how gorgeous Flo is. One of her friends said it was like being around a movie star. No way. Wow. That much attention? 
So I didn't think she was like glamorous like a movie star. Like you think of somebody – when somebody says like, wow, it was like being around a movie star, you think of somebody that's like hair, makeup, maybe like a fancy outfit or something. To me, Florence was beautiful, but she was very understated. Like I felt like she looked more like – the best comparison I I could think of when I'm looking at pictures of her is Emily from Friends. Emily who marries Ross, the British Emily. Yeah. I think sometimes when people are referring to that magnetic energy, it doesn't really necessarily have to do with like all the glam and everything. It's the attention that gravitates towards them when they enter a room. That's so true. And everyone said Flo had that for sure. Yeah. So if she was kind of like more of a just, you know, Emily was like classically pretty and very put together. And if she kind of had that effortlessly chic vibe that I'm sure a lot of actors go for. It's like that quiet luxury that's all the rave right now. It is. She is so quiet luxury. That would be Flo's type to the max. And she does have that kind of like, even like late 90s, the the comparisons I was thinking of were like (laughs) Emily from Friends and like Maura Tierney from ER. But like, this is like all the like must-see TV of the late 90s, (laughs) like those ladies. (laughs) But like wearing a nice Calvin Klein sweater and some Levi's, but still turning all of the heads with her energy. Like an oversized blouse that's like really crisp and nice jeans and like minimal jewelry, minimal makeup, but still just. Yeah. That was very flow. That's exactly. I can't believe you have the picture of her so well and you haven't even seen a picture of her. But that's what she looked like. Her husband, Mark, he definitely, he was like a few years older. He was like five and a half years older, but he looked more like his age. Like he was like a typical dad, like, you know, getting a little soft in the middle, losing his hair. But Flo was definitely still a stunner who definitely could have gone, (laughs) like people would have definitely thought she looked in her like late 20s. Mark and Flo made it a tradition to bring the kids up to the lake, which was just under a four-hour drive from their home in the upscale Huntington Woods suburb, which is just north of Detroit, Michigan, which I think is like a perfect drive. When you have something that's like between three and a half and four hours, you really feel like you're going somewhere. You're definitely away from your home. It feels like a trip, but it's not so exhaustingly long to drive. They usually came during the bustling summer season when the cabins were booked every single day of the week and they always sold out. But the Ungers' marriage had been in distress lately. It had been teetering on the edge of divorce for months. Mark decided to take the family on one last Watervale trip before it closed for the season. It was, after all, Flo's happy place. And he was trying to make her happy once again after the last few months and years, really, of disappointments. So it was thus that the Ungers found themselves the only guests at Watervale, save the proprietors, on a chilly but blisteringly beautiful late October weekend in 2003. Almost all of the cabins had been closed down for the winter. Lynn had put away all of the deck chairs, the outside furniture, save for one chaise lounge already. And He and Maggie had just come back from a trip to the West Coast, and I believe they were either going back out to the West Coast or heading to Florida for the winter, as they always did. So he was kind of eager to close the whole place down and get to the warm weather because it was cold. This is October 24th in northern Michigan. It's getting real chilly. In fact, all of the official Watervale cabins were already closed down and completely weatherized for the season. So Dory, Maggie's cousin, has her own cabins that they kind of run together, but they're two separate entities. And Dory had one cabin that hadn't been closed down yet. So the Ungers are literally the only family that's here. But it's beautiful out because it's also still full color. So all of the trees are just exploding in yellows and reds and oranges, which you can imagine reflecting off the lake. It's gorgeous. It's just cold. So at this point, Mark is really just hoping that the beautiful views and taking Flo back to this phenomenal place that they've gone for years and years will help rejuvenate the marriage that was kind of faltering at this point. A boater would later recall meeting Mark and Flo on their very first night up at the lake. He said that he saw a candle flickering between them as they stole a moment on the boathouse's deck together. It seemed like 
a night of promise and maybe one of reconciliation. Until one partner went missing in the wee hours of the night, only to be found drowned in the lake the next morning. When friends and family began to reach out to the police with their inside information about the state of the Unger's marriage, the authorities would be forced to take a closer look at the site of the alleged accident. When they delved deeper into Flo and Mark's history, they found a dark underbelly that lurked behind the facade of the perfect family. There were addiction issues, financial issues, betrayals, both large and small, and both known and perhaps unknown. Years after this fatal family vacation, one partner would remain dead while the other would be on trial for their murder. Today, we'll be talking about the fatal marriage of Flo and Mark Unger and whether or not justice was served in the end. It's always so sad when it's like a couple and then it's kids. It's really sad. It's devastating. I think we were just talking about this on Current Affairs that there was a case recently that was very tragic, but for once there wasn't children involved. And that always gives me a sigh of relief. Because it's just like then they lose both their parents. Yeah. Realistically. And how old are the kids? They're seven and 10. And they're really cute. Oh, gosh, they're so cute. So my primary source today was the book Afraid of the Dark by Tom Henderson. I also watched an episode of Forensic Files and the show Dark Waters, Murder in the Deep. There was also a couple articles I read, which I will make sure to mention as I quote and will also put in the show notes. You lucky bitch, you got to watch Forensic Files. I love any opportunity. The first thing I do when I am looking into any case is see, see if there is a Forensic Files about it. Although I missed one. I think I did not watch the Forensic Files on Erica and BJ Sifrit. And I wish I had. Now I'm jealous I didn't. <laughs> this was actually a very good Forensic Files and you get to see some of the people involved in this case. So I recommend it. It'll be in the notes like which season and episode it was. So let's talk about Mark and Flo, and we're going to do age before beauty here. So we'll start with Mark. Mark was born on November 29th, 1960. He had an affluent upbringing in the desirable Huntington Woods neighborhood, which we briefly mentioned in the introduction. Mark's mom owned a string of popular restaurants and I believe a resort in the Florida Keys. So they were doing very well for themselves. So they probably split the season, I'm guessing. I'm not really sure how it worked. Little is known, as far as I could find out, about all of Mark's family dynamics growing up. I would say that this book, and I really do like the author, Tom Henderson. He's great. But it, it didn't delve as deeply into Mark and Flo's childhoods as some of these other books do. Okay. But he did go to a fancy private day school which everyone said was like a feeder for the Ivy Leagues. All the kids who went there had a lot of money, went to great schools afterwards. And he was involved in plenty of sports there. He was definitely a smart guy, but he was more of a sports dude than a real academic. Okay. He played football. He was on the swim team. And he even went to states two years in a row for tennis. Yeah. You said Florida, right? So I feel like there's a lot of tennis schools down there. Yeah, he's primarily growing up in Huntington Woods in Michigan, which is just north of Detroit. Yep. And then his mom owns a bunch of places in the Keys. Mark went to University of Michigan after graduation and ultimately turned his love of all things sports related into his dream job. He became a radio sportscaster. He broke into sports broadcasting well in the Florida Keys, working at one of his mother's restaurants, and eventually he moved back to Detroit and got a gig with WJZZ, which if you look at it, if you look at their call symbol. WJZ. Yes. And you're like me and apparently Andy and have the sense of humor of a teenage boy. All I could think of was that it was WJZ. It was apparently a jazz station, so that makes sense. Yeah, but then, like, put in the A. <laughs> I, don't th I think you are only allowed to have the four letters. And they all have to start with, like, a W or a K or something like that. So, yeah, he was on WJZZ. By the late 1980s, with Detroit sports flourishing, Mark was in heaven. He often told people that he had the greatest job in the world. 
In fall of 1987, the Detroit Tigers were in the playoffs, and Mark scored a huge personal win as well. He became acquainted with the beautiful love of his life, Florence Stern, who was at the time a student at his alma mater of University of Michigan. Now, this was not technically the first meeting for the future married couple when they hooked up in 1987. In a weird way, Flo and Mark kind of were connected a couple degrees through family friends. Mark had a much older half-sister. So his half-sister, Connie, was 20 years older than him. Wow. Yep. And her kids were closer in age to Mark then, because I think that they were like eight and 10 years younger than him, potentially, around that. And so it turns out that Connie's daughter, who was the older one, was friends with Flo growing up because they all grew up in Huntington Woods. Crazy. So he had met her for the first time, I think, when she was 16 and he was in his early 20s and he wasn't really that interested in her. She's a high school kid. And he also said that the only thing he could really remember of her at the time was that she was extremely self-assured. And that might be where you were getting that essence of the energy, the charisma. Like, even at 16, the way she held herself was very confident to a point where he was like, yeah, she was so self-assured. She seemed a little snooty, he said. It's crazy that a woman who feels self-assured is snooty, but a man who feels self-assured is like a successful man. Yes, like he's projecting success. He's just confident. I think we're getting farther away from that, but I was like, ugh, gross. I know. It's <laughs> so of that time. Yep. But as Flo went from self-assured teenager to a bright, beautiful, self-assured woman, Mark certainly changed his tune about that bratty little teenager. Yeah. So there was a couple different family type celebrations, like when his technically niece, but they're closer in age, when she had her high school graduation. Now they're 18. It's been a couple of years. And then he saw her at another party a couple of years after that. So now she's in her early 20s. I think she was 20 when they re-met. Now she's just gorgeous. She's funny. She's interesting. She's going to the school he had graduated from. And I guess he had injured himself somehow. It was like an old sports injury, I think. And he was he had to have surgery and he was recovering at home. And his niece came to visit him. And she had mentioned something about Flo. And he's like, can you have her call me? Can you like set us up? And she's like, uh, let's see. So she ended up like bringing Flo by for like 10 minutes one day to his house. And then they left. And he was like, okay, if it's okay with Flo, I'd like to like call her in a few days. Because he's trying to play it cool. And he was totally surprised because Flo called him the very next day. And she's like, I'm not going to wait for you to call around for me. <laughs> I'm just going to straight up call you if you want to hang out. <laughs> Love her. Yes, she's great. So Feisty Flo had been born in 1966 and also enjoyed an affluent upbringing after she was adopted by Harold and Claire Stern. Harold was a very successful and politically connected attorney who was just head over heels for his little girl. Flo was described as having natural charm and a sparkle in her eye from an early age. She was drawn to beauty and pursued photography. She also loved antiques. She loved anything about setting up a house, Finding like diamonds in the rough, we've kind of talked about that with like antiques and spending hours going through places, which Andy can do and I cannot. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things to do. It is, and she drags me along and I just make fun of everything. You're like, do, 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 do. <laughs> it's true. Oh, look at that. Look at that creepy doll. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a natural shopper of anything. <laughs> I could sit at a restaurant for like four hours though. <laughs> Yeah, so she has, like, you would get this, but she has, like, that eye for detail, for beauty, for style, for, you know, our friend Char, who's a set designer, like, has that, the same thing. So the couple got engaged in 1989 after two years of dating, which Mark said was kind of funny because when he was taking her to the restaurant where he proposed, she was like, we've been dating for two years. Don't you think it's time we got engaged? Giving him shit. <laughs> yeah, like giving him shit, being like, dude, come on, I'm a catch. Like, let's move this along. And he was like dying because he knew he was proposing to her. Although I have to say, I cannot approve 
of his choice of proposal because he put the diamond ring in her brownie sundae. Just no. Maybe going back to my dad being a dentist, but I'm like, you're going to break your teeth on that thing. Like it was hidden in there? It was hidden in the brownie sundae. I don't get when people do that. I know. And I know it's like it's totally a thing that people do all the time. Like you see it in movies. It happens. I know people it's happened too. But yeah, so even though this doesn't sound like our ideal proposal, apparently Flo was overjoyed. She loved it. She started crying immediately because as soon as she found it, he got down on one knee. Uh, She was overjoyed. What restaurant was it? Do you know? I do not. It wasn't like Ruby Tuesdays. Red Lobster. (laughs) The Ungers were married on February 24th, 1990 at a big fancy temple in like nearby Bloomfield Hills, which is supposed to be another very nice area. And then they honeymooned in Mexico for 11 days. Wow. I know, that sounds nice. Mark and Flo were a very happy couple. They enjoyed each other's company and they wanted the same things out of life, which is very important. They absolutely wanted to have children and they wanted to raise their kids in their shared Jewish faith in Huntington Woods where they had both grown up and still had a close circle of friends and family. Cool. Now, this was kind of tough to accomplish because it was a very costly area to live, and Mark was only making $400 a week as a DJ. He's not doing sports broadcasting? It's the same thing. Like, he was, he was like a sports DJ on Jizz channel. So he's like, okay, today we're going to talk about hockey. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it was. This was his dream job. So it was worth it for him to maybe not make as much money as he could have doing other things because he loved it. And Flo was just working in a jewelry store, basically part time. So she's working retail. So yeah, and that's not realistic then to live in that community. In like a very fancy community. They did eventually find a very small house that was still like in the community. So they could afford this house. But after the birth of their first son, Max, Flo quit her job to be a stay-at-home mom, which also was the plan. They always wanted Flo to stay at home. And the couple definitely got in financially over their heads because they were kind of spending like they had growing up, but their parents had a lot more money than they did. So they expected almost like all of the same things they had growing up, like, oh, we belong to a club, like, and we have personal trainers and we eat out all the time. All the things that they grew up having, but they weren't really providing for themselves like their parents had provided for them, you know? So they got into a really bad financial hole. And they also had their own personal things that they spent too much money on. Flo's weakness was shopping. She loved antiques. They don't come cheap. Well, Mark had a gambling issue. Whoa. Okay. Wow. So to dig the young family out of their financial hole, Mark left his dream job and he became a mortgage banker. In his first six months, Mark made more money than he could have as his previous job in several years. I feel like if he wanted to, you could still like moonlight as a sports DJ. That's what he ends up doing. He ends up being a fill-in. So you still have the passion project going on. Yeah, on the side. And the couple had their second child, a son named Tyler. And on the surface, they seem to be doing better than ever because now he's really pulling in this salary that lets them afford the lifestyle that they wanted. Flo is a very happy stay-at-home mom. And she's also pursuing her own side passion project. She was doing freelance photography on the side. So everything seemed like it was going very well. But behind closed doors, Mark was an absolute mess. He hated his job, hated, hated, hated being a mortgage banker. So he obviously missed being a full-time radio sportscaster, but he also had a problem ethically with being a mortgage banker because the company that he worked for would push him to approve loans that he knew his clients could not afford. So it was very predatory. They were even faking W-2s to get loans approved. Oh, my God. And so these poor people would default on their loans, and then they would take the house after they had paid into it. Oh, that's evil. 
it was racist too because he was working in Detroit and a lot of the population that was coming to this company, because it's a private company, were people that had been rejected from banks for a mortgage. And so a lot of them were low income and they were coming just because they were desperately trying to buy a house. And this predatory company would say, for sure, you can afford it. You can get this house. Like, we'll approve this loan. And then when they defaulted, they'd take the house away from them. Wow, that's so fucked up. And he knew it was fucked up. So he was happy to be providing for his family and Flo was so happy. And he's always been madly in love with her. But he's doing a very bad thing. And he is stressed about it. He's stressed about what's going to happen. He also knew that this was going to cause a financial crisis, which it did in 2008. Yeah. And also it's a ticking time bomb until the government figures that shit out. Like you're faking W-2s. Yeah. This company got into big trouble later on. He wasn't working there anymore when that happened. There's all of that going on. And then to add insult to injury, or rather injury to injury, Mark had an old sports injury that caused incessant pain in his upper back. Mm, So is he addicted to pills too? Yep. In 1998, he went to go see a doctor about his chronic pain and they prescribed him opioids and muscle relaxers. That's a powerful combination. Yep. He soon became addicted to these prescription drugs, like we saw in last week's episode with Velma. And he still was addicted to gambling, too. And around the same time, MGM Grand moved a casino into the Detroit area. So he was deep in the throes of both of these addictions in the early 2000s, plus a little dollop of alcoholism, apparently. So he's drinking, he's popping pills, he's staying out all night gambling, he's losing the family's money, and he's getting cash advances on their credit cards to continue gambling when he loses all the money. Yeah, the interest rate on those is really high. Really high. That's like the worst case scenario, like for needing cash. It was a bad situation. And of course, he and Flo are fighting nonstop. Even if he had the money to be spending this recklessly. The fact that he's, they have small kids and he's out all night and she doesn't know where he is or when he's coming back or he's kind of zonked out on pills, that is not an ideal situation for a young mother at all. They were sleeping in separate bedrooms. Flo was very much at her wit's end. In September of 2002, following an intervention that was led by Flo, Mark finally realized that he had to make some very big changes in his life if he was going to keep his family together. He checked himself into a top-notch rehab facility in Grand Rapids, which is across the state from where his family lived in Huntington Woods. And he was in that rehab for five months. But also that costs money, doesn't it? It costs a lot of money. I don't think his insurance, it, it certainly did not cover all five months. It might have covered a few weeks. So his mom might have helped with that bill, I believe, because she still had a lot of money. But yeah, so that's costing a lot of money. He's obviously out of work while he's in this rehab. And, you know, he's getting help, which is great. He needs to get help. It's fantastic that he's doing this. But this is really hard on flow. If you think about it, when you have little kids, having your spouse gone for five months Not working. Not working, not helping to provide for the family, just absent and getting better, which is important, but it's very stressful. And of course, at this time, this is the early 2000s, you know, we didn't think of addiction as the disease that we know it is today. At that time in history, people were like, well, you're just weak if you can't stop drinking and doing drugs and gambling. Those were things that people had a moral judgment about. Yeah, but it's the pills. We don't have any of the knowledge that we have today on how addictive those are. Yep. We had none of the awareness of what these pills do to people, how highly addictive they are. And so Flo and her family are getting to a point where they're like, he got himself into this situation. He's the one out drinking and gambling the family's money away. And now he gets to go to a fancy rehab facility 
and just do therapy all day and go to the gym and feel good about himself. Well, she's at home with two kids trying to tell them where their father is without making him look bad, trying to keep the family together, figuring out how the hell she's going to support her family at that point. So she's getting really pissed off. And she was forced to go back to work when all she wanted to do was be a stay-at-home mom, and that had always been her family's plan. Ironically, she became a mortgage banker herself. But at an honest bank? She worked at like a, a mainstream bank. She didn't work at like a shady company like that he was working at. So she's working at at a company now. She's working at a, a bank and she's doing mortgages. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, now I'll do the job you hate. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. And also take care of the children. Exactly. So when Mark came home in February of 2003, he was happier than ever. He was committed to his sobriety. He had never felt better. He had lost a bunch of weight, which had also been an issue in their relationship because when they first got together, you know, he was Mr. Sports. They did a lot of physical activity together. She was attracted to somebody who was physically fit and active. And she maintained that while he had gotten into the throes of his addictions, he had gained a lot of weight and he stopped doing active things with her and the family. So she hadn't been attracted to him in a while. So he comes back and he's like, I look good. I feel good. I love you. Of course, he's realized how much she went through during all of his issues. And so he's like, you've been great. I'm so in love with you, my beautiful wife of over a decade at this point. And she's like, yeah, I'm not. I am not feeling you anymore. Like, it's great. I'm glad you're healthy. I want you to be in good shape. I want the best for you because you are the father of our beautiful children. But I'm done. I have decidedly lost that loving feeling. So Flo began to tell her friends as early as November, so when he had been in the rehab facility for a couple months at that point, that she wanted to divorce Mark while he was still in rehab. But she was not going to kick a dog while he was down. She didn't want to interfere with his recovery. So she said that she was going to wait and give it some time. Right when he comes back, she tells him? No, she just, they were still living in separate rooms at that point. And he was like, I'll do anything to earn your trust back. And I don't know if she was ready at that point, if she was just doing it for him. The people that she talked to, her friends and family, make it sound like she was pretty decided when he came home, but she wanted to give him some time and some space to see if they could make any changes. And also just to allow him to have a few months at home learning a new way to be sober for himself and for the family before she pulled the rug out from under him. But adding to Flo's already long list of complaints was that Mark decided not to go back to work after he got out. Come on, Mark. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He did have a significant amount of disability money. He had had two disability insurance policies that ended up paying out 10 grand a month. What? Andy, I'm so excited about this week's sponsor, Haya Health. Absolutely. Nothing matters as much to us as our kids' health. And so when we learned about Haya's children's vitamins, we were just thrilled. Typical children's vitamins are basically just candy in disguise, filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk growing kids should definitely not eat. That's why Haya was created. It's a pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Did you know that most children's vitamins are filled with 5 grams of sugar? Serious gasp. Haya is made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk, yet it tastes great and is perfect for picky eaters. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste that they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, it has a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies and is supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. Haya is designed for kids of all ages and sent straight to your door so parents have one less thing to worry about. 
Yeah, I love, love, love Haya, and so do my kids. My dad is a dentist. I know I've mentioned that on the show before. And it's so unfortunate he sees so many little guys with cavities, and it's not their parents' fault at all. They're giving them gummy vitamins to help their growth and help their little bodies. And then the gummy bits get stuck on or in between the teeth, and there you go. You have cavities. And it's so unfortunate because parents are just trying to help their kids. Yeah, I've noticed even with Echo's little baby teeth, a lot of them have really deep holes and stuff can get stuck in there really quick. So I could only imagine what the difference would be between a gummy and the Haya. I also really, really loved how you can customize the bottle. Did you see the cute stickers that it comes with? The kids love them. Yeah, Echo decorated her bottle with me last night. It was really cute. So we have worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin, and you can receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash lovemurder. 50%. Well, this deal is not available on their regular website. So go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H, HayaHealth.com slash lovemurder, and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Are they like private? They're not government then. I think they're private. Yeah, this was not a government disability program. So there's some sort of like life insurance thing, but disability insurance. Yes, it's just like life insurance, but you can also get disability insurance. Like Nathaniel has it because for a long time I was a stay-at-home mom. And so we had life insurance in case something happened to him. But I was like, well, what if you're still alive, but something just prevents you from being able to work? We'd also be in a very hard situation. So it looks like he had a lot of those policies as well. So he's like, why should I go back to work? And I'm not sure if it was his addiction issues or his back injury, but that qualified him, one of those things. So he now could just take disability. And apparently the policies he's had would pay out this much money until he got a job or turned 65. What? Yeah. (laughs) This is pretty crazy. So basically now he's like, well, I don't have to work. I am providing for the family through my disability. But the ironic thing is that if it was because he had a back injury that he can't work, he went to the the gym. He got himself a personal trainer. He was getting in the best shape of his life while not working because he – Disability. Because of his disability. And this was driving Flo crazy. Oh, my gosh. It would drive me crazy. Yeah. She's still working at the bank. So she also is now like thinking – I'm going to divorce this guy. So it's not even like she wants to live off of his disability money. She knows when she divorces him, she's going to have to provide for herself. She's not going to get some of his disability money anymore. So she's working at the bank and he's going to the gym. He's going to therapy. He's working on himself. He's having a great time. He's playing a ton of golf and he's not doing anything around the house. So she's still doing all the laundry, doing all the cooking, doing all the cleaning. She said that he maybe packed the kids lunches. He would do bedtime for them, but that was about it. So she's so tired and stressed and the final straw was when he let a cable guy essentially like a cable TV guy into the house and then left to go golfing not thinking about the fact that their son was going to come home and there was going to be a strange man in the house. And she got a panicked phone call from her eldest son being like, dad's not here and there's this strange guy here while she's at work. How are you going to leave a strange man in our home so you can go golfing when you know our kid is about to get off the school bus? I cannot. I would be fuming. She was basically like, I'm done. I'm acting like a single mother. I'm doing everything and working and We don't have any sort of romantic or physical relationship because when you get to the point of disgust in a marriage, it's very hard to come back from that. He was physically revolting to her at that point. Even though he was now getting back in shape and everything, it didn't matter. She was just irritated. There's different types of love language, though. Like him helping out around the house could be a love language that would have helped with their relationship. 100% acts of service. More than any gift, more than anything Nathaniel can say, when he takes something off of my load, I'm like, oh, I'm so obsessed with you. (laughs) So she filed for divorce on August 26th, 2003. So he had gotten out of rehab in February and she had given it some time, but that was it. That was the last straw. That was a good amount of time. She did. She tried. 
they had been in couples counseling since he got out of rehab. So they had been working with a counselor this entire time. She went to go see an attorney. She got everything ready to prepare him for being served. And then she broke the news to him at a counseling session. Okay. That's probably smart. I think it's really smart. I think that she wanted to ease this transition as much as possible. She, at this point, she wanted to be forward thinking about this. Because she didn't want to have all this resentment. She wanted to co-parent very well. And she knew how much her children loved their father. And she wasn't going to take that away from them. Okay. Mark was shocked. Now, I've heard a lot about this from various divorce attorneys who can follow on TikTok. There's like a whole divorce attorney TikTok talking about things that went wrong in relationships and what they see all the time. Oh, my God. That's like your favorite thing ever. <laughs> it's my I love like understanding why relationships work or why they desperately don't work, which is this podcast. Hence, the worst thing that can happen to a bad relationship is this podcast. But I mean, women get to, especially women in these types of heterosexual relationships, get to a point where they're done. They're just done. And they're not even mad anymore. They're just done. I think women become indifferent and protective of themselves and their families before they even sometimes say things out loud. They're like yeah. 10 steps ahead planning on how they're going to take care of themselves, how they're going to survive, what they're going to do for their kids. It's just part of like how women are. Yeah. And they also, they have been for years usually telling their husband what they need, how they need them to step up. They say it over and over and over again. And then by the time they actually get to filing, the woman's like, I'm emotionally moved on from this. So done. Yeah. Yeah. I just want it to be done. Let's just like, you know, dot the I's, cross the T's. And the man is an emotional wreck. He's like, how could this happen? Gobsmacked. Gobsmacked. I am shocked that you are ending our marriage. Like after years of complaints that they apparently didn't hear. But yeah, so Mark was completely taken aback by this. Of course he was. Yeah. They'd been married for 13 and a half years at this point. And he said that he didn't realize how truly miserable Flo had been. So like, I'm a stranger reading this account, and I can just feel it through the pages of this book how deeply unhappy she's been. So he was having a very hard time letting go of the idea of being with Flo and keeping the family together. I do think because she was so attractive— his marriage to her was a point of pride as well. So this is wrapped up in, I'm sure, some sort of love and mother of his children, but also an ego thing that his partner was so charismatic and so beautiful. Unfortunately, they wanted different things. So in Michigan, if one person wants to get divorced, there's no like conversation about it. It's like, no, you're getting divorced. That's the way it is. It takes two people to get into a marriage, but only one person to get out. So he didn't want to get divorced at all, but he, she was going to push it through. And the attorney that worked with Flo said, the only thing that you guys are going to have an issue with, because you're going to get divorced one way or another, is the custody situation. Because she was even like, I don't need your money. I'm going to take care of myself. The money stuff was not an issue. It was who was going to get physical custody of the children. And Flo wanted the kids to be full time with her, even though they would have visitation with their father. And Mark wanted the same thing. He wanted the kids full time with him. Well, that's a little unrealistic when he was at rehab for five months and now he doesn't even like know when to take care of them at home. Yes. And that's what Flo's attorney said. Flo's attorney said, look, I know you don't want to drag him through the mud and you don't want to bring up his addiction issues, but you have to because that's the only way you're going to ensure that you get 100% physical custody of the children. But it's also a very important point when you're raising two kids that are pre-teen. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, the whole going golfing and leaving a strange adult man in the home when your children are coming home from school, she brought that up because that was what was really driving her crazy. And he did that when he was 100% sober. Yeah. And so she had been like, can't we focus on that and not the fact that he was also a terrible parent and gone because of his addiction issues because she really was trying to do the right thing. She did not want to make him feel bad. But her attorney said, no, you obviously have to bring this up too. And so on Tuesday, October 21st, the soon-to-be ex-couple went to a preliminary hearing. Now, this hearing was kind of 
along the lines of a mediation. It was a, a hearing, but also kind of a first meeting between both parties to see if there could be any reconciliation and in the case that there wasn't. How would they proceed in a way that would be the best for the boys? It was like, I think, a governmental program to help people divorcing, try to keep the focus on their families and their children rather than getting very ugly and angry with each other. But it came up at this hearing, which I think Tom Henderson pointed out was kind of ironic, was that they're having this meeting about how they have to go through everything and they should do it thinking about their children. But at the same time, they also were disclosing why they'd be fighting for full custody and what their reasons were that they should get the kids. So it came up that she was going to bring up his addiction issues in divorce court during this initial meeting where her attorney was like, hey, can you just fill this out for us? And it's like, I have been addicted to this at this point. I have gone through rehab for this. Like he is going to have to check off like, yes, I was addicted to gambling. Yes, I was addicted to prescription drugs. Yes, I had a unhealthy relationship with alcohol. And this is making him very angry. Well, they're all truths, sir. Yes. And because he didn't want this to be on the record, of course. But she's like, I'm sorry, this is just something we have to go through. Now, Mark, at this point, he sees her after this hearing and he's like, this is getting ugly. And I don't want it to get ugly because I still love you. And she's like, I know, but Mark, if you want to fight for full custody, this is going to be something we're going to have to talk about. And I don't want to do it. I didn't want to do this. This is my attorney. And you know, it's my attorney. And he's like, look, I called Watervale. We have had so many times there that were so special. Why don't we just go away this weekend? It's the last weekend. It's the last time we'll ever go up as a couple that's married with an intact family. The boys will be so excited. We'll bring the dog. It's a whole thing. And we can just talk about this stuff. And maybe we can come to an agreement. Maybe we can figure out, like, I have the kids, like, every weekend and you get, you know, I don't know exactly what it is. But he basically said, like, I'd rather just, like, talk to you person to person about this in a place that we love. Now, Flo did not think this was necessarily a good idea because she was worried about giving him hope for a reconciliation when she was very decided to get divorced already. And she could tell that. Wanting to go on this trip was a little bit about maybe going back to their favorite place and being a family again and having those old loving feelings. But she talked to her attorney about it. And her attorney said, actually, this is a pretty good idea. I do think that considering everything we're talking about, it would show family unity. And it would show your boys that even though you're getting a divorce, you're still a family and you always will be a family. And she had no reason to suspect anything nefarious. He had never been physically or even emotionally abusive. I mean, the person Mark had always hurt was himself. So she wasn't scared of him. She just was like, is this a good idea from an emotional perspective? So her attorney said, no, you should go. And she told several friends that she very much did not want to go on a trip with Mark, but she did think it was going to be good for her children. And in fact, they were even talking about doing a Christmas break trip together. But she had fretted to a friend that they were supposed to have their first appearance in divorce court in December. So she's like, Ugh, I don't know how if we, we plan a whole vacation and then things get ugly in court. I don't know how that vacation is going to go down. But she was trying. And Mark did. I mean, she was right to be worried because he did have a very different idea of what was going to happen on this trip. Those close to him believed that he thought that this would potentially convince her to give their relationship and their family as he thought of it. Like, you know, they're still a family even if you're divorced. Unit. Yeah, but their family unit, another shot. That very week that they had this hearing and then they ended up going up to the lake, he told a mutual friend that knew both of them that he had come out of the shower or something the other day and that Flo had commented on how much weight he had lost and he had responded, because I want to be your man again. And that friend was like, well, what happened after that? Did you give her a hug? And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm like really slow playing this. I'm doing baby steps because I don't want to move too fast and spook her. But he made his intention to win back his wife very clear. So maybe this trip was Mark's bid at winning back his wife, whom everyone knew was, he was still madly in love with, or there would be some suggestion down the line that maybe Mark's motivations were far darker. 
On Friday, October 24th, around 3.30 p.m., the Ungers pulled into the driveway at Watervale. Maggie Duncan checked them in while the boys and the dogs ran around the property playing. So Maggie's cousin, Dory, who owned half the cabins and actually owned the one that the Ungers would be staying in, which they're all named after women, all the cabins. Hilarious. (laughs) Yeah. So they were staying in the Mary Ellen. Well, I think Dory was in her own cabin, the Joanna. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah. So Dory said that she looked out her window and she was just so happy to see them because everyone knew the Ungers. They were basically regulars. But also, it's just like a nice scene, like the beautiful foliage in the back. And then there's these happy 7 and 10-year-old and their dog like all running around. It's just a beautiful, joyous scene. So everybody looks like they're having a great time. At this whole resort, there's only the Duncans, the couple. Dory, the cousin, and the Ungers. And then there was another guy who was around who was kind of like a caretaker, but he wasn't actually staying at the cottages that evening. So it's very quiet. All three parties went out to dinner separately that evening. The Ungers taking their sons to a restaurant called Dingy's. (laughs) Cute. Yeah. Around 8 p.m. when it was already dark, the winter caretaker of Watervale was this guy named Fred Oofline, and he owned a nearby camp and a business. So there was a camp that he owned that was like across from the lake. So in the summer, he lived at the camp. In the winter, he actually moved into one of the Watervale cottages and took care of their whole resort while they were away for the winter. So I think it was like, it was a deal. Like he got a free cottage or cabin, but then he took care of everything for them. It's crazy how seasonal it has to be up there because of how cold it is. It gets real cold. Fred was leaving the cottage at Watervale and he was going to get into his boat to go across the lake to his camp to shut everything down. And while he was going towards the boathouse, he did see a candle burning on the rooftop. And so how this this boathouse is basically set into a mound, like kind of like it's in the hill almost. And there's a deck that people can hang out on on top of that with a like a a railing and then below there's like this concrete they call it an apron that comes out where you can tie the boats to and it's in pretty shallow water these weren't like where the big motor boats were or anything it was like mostly like smaller boats like paddle boats or like a little boat with like a, a one little like what are they called like overboard motors or what are they called yeah just the motors that hang off the back exactly yeah My grandpa, my dad's dad, had a lake house on Lake Buckeye. And we had in the canals to go to the houses, you had to like pull up and put down a different motor for the shallower water. Yep. So that's exactly what you should imagine in this scenario. It's kind of like he's coming up from almost like down below to go towards his boat. And he sees the flickering candle. And from the dark, because it's already dark, he hears a woman's voice go, Lynn? Lynn, are you out there? Because there's nobody at this resort at the time. So she sees a man approaching. She obviously assumes it's Lynn Duncan, but it was Fred and Fred had never met the Ungers. So he goes up to introduce himself because he doesn't want to be like creepy dude skulking around in the dark. And he said that Flo was really nice. He said he described her as bubbly. He felt bad because he obviously thought he was interrupting a romantic moment with this flickering candlelight going on. But he soon found out that maybe less than a romantic evening, it was just Flo being scared of the dark because he explained that he was where he lived and what he was doing and that he was going to now get in his boat and go across the pitch black lake. He was wearing um, one of those headgear lights. Super cool. Yeah, like, like I always imagine like the miners. And so he's like, no, I'm not scared at all. She's like, I could never, ever do that because I am so afraid of the dark. She said, like, never in a million years would she get in a boat on the dark lake. It is eerie. Also, I mean, if you're used to more city or suburb lights and you're in the middle of northern Michigan on a dark lake, there's no city lights coming from anywhere. It's just you and the stars. It's quiet. They're out in the woods. No one's at this resort. So this is where the name Afraid of the Dark comes from, from Tom Henderson's book. And several people came forward later to say that Flo was almost pathologically terrified of the dark. 
to the point that if she drove home late, she would call her neighbor on her cell phone and ask her neighbor to come out to her car and walk her to her front door. She was so scared of the dark, she wouldn't even walk from her driveway to her front door. But she's outside by herself? She was with Mark. Okay. So she's out with Mark, and then Fred walks by, and he's talking to both of them. Oh, he was talking to both of them. Okay. Yes, he's talking to both of them. So they were both up there. And as a child, she slept with all of the lights on. So she was really, really scared of the dark. So much so that she brought it up casually to a perfect stranger. So they ended up saying their goodnights. And Fred heard Mark ask Flo as he was leaving if she wanted a chair or a cushion. Because at this point, Lynn had taken away all of the deck furniture. The only thing that was up there was a really large chaise lounge that he could not move by himself. So he's like, do you want me to get you a chair? Do you want a cushion? He heard Flo say, no, thank you. She was going to stand. And then he went off to his side of the lake. And he said that he knew it was past nine by the time he got in his cabin on the other side of the lake, lit at the fire and started his stove because he turned the TV on and Dateline was on. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's one of us. He's like, oh, must be after nine. Uh, it's Friday night. Dateline's on, baby. So funny, the things that we use as reference. Yeah. He was like, oh, well, because they are asking him later on. They're trying to get timelines from everyone who, of course, saw the Ungers. And he's like, well, it must have been past nine because Dateline was on. The Duncans got home around 9.15 p.m. Dory got home shortly after that. And she said that she noticed that the boathouse was completely dark. So I'm thinking like 9.20. By that time, there's no candles flickering. Now, he had seen them around eight. We don't know how long it took him to get across the lake, tie up his boat, get into his cabin, start a fire. But by like 9.20-ish, there's no lights happening whatsoever. And apparently there is supposed to be a light bulb there. There's supposed to be some sort of light that's on 24-7, but it had burned out and it was the end of the season, so no one had replaced it. Because why would they? No one's going to be there. For the winter, yeah. For the winter. So it's completely pitch dark where the Ungers had previously been. Dory said that she walked her dog around 10 and she did note that the light was on at the Mary Ellen, which was the cabin that the Ungers were staying in. Eventually, like at 10, I think everyone was settled in. Everyone went to sleep. It's a dark, cold night. It's perfect night to go to bed early and get some rest. So everyone's asleep. Well, almost everyone. At 7.38 in the morning the next day, the Duncans got a phone call that they would remember for the rest of their lives, though they wish they could forget. Mark was on the other end of the phone looking for Flo. He claimed that Flo had not come home the night before and asked the Duncans if they could go look for her. Mm. So they thought this was very strange. So it's 7.38 in the morning, they get this call, and he's like, Flo never came home last night, and I don't know where she is. And if the kids are old enough to go home by themselves after school while you're golfing, they're old enough to stay at home while you go look for your missing wife. Yes. Lynn and Maggie were like, well, what do you want us to do? Like, why are you letting us know? And he's like, well, can you go look for her? And they're like, okay, I, I guess so. They thought this whole thing was weird. And they also knew, Maggie knew because she had talked to Flo before, that they were likely getting a divorce. This thing felt very weird in general, but they were like, of course – will help you out. So they just threw clothes on. And Maggie said she was walking just a little bit ahead of Lynn, who was still putting his shoes on. And the first place that they went to, the most logical place, was the boathouse deck. And they saw that the chaise lounge had been moved from like one side to the other. So they must have been out there at some point. So she's like, oh, okay, I'll just go look over there. Plus, like, let's say if she had gotten up early in the morning to go for a jog, that's like a great place to view the lake then. She doesn't see her, though on the deck. So she's like, okay, well, she's not here. So she and then Lynn, when he caught up with her, walked right up to the railing and she looks down and Flo is down below in the shallows of the lake, bobbing face down, surrounded by this like pink foamy water. So scary. It's so scary. And they were both in shock. 
you don't know what to do. Like it's not computing. Your brain is trying to make sense of it. And at that point, Maggie was like, well, I guess I should call 911. And Lynn was like, yeah. So Lynn got off the deck and went down to get closer to her to make sure that there was nothing he could do to help her, obviously. And Maggie called 911 and she sounds very discombobulated. She's clearly like flustered. She doesn't know really what's happening. So she says that she's reporting a suicide or a drowning or something. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't imagine trying to put words together. Yeah. She didn't know what had happened. She couldn't like make it make sense. The dispatcher asked her if Flo had been depressed and she said, quote, yeah, she has been, I believe. It looks like she had a quilt. My husband saw it look like maybe she came down here to sleep and got a quilt. And whether she just went over the side, I don't know, is what she said. I mean, that's like something that could definitely happen if someone's also like, we don't know if she's on medicine, like if you're in a deep sleep and you roll off the side. People sleepwalk all the time. Yeah. And the thing about suicide, though, the, the suicide thing is a little strange because the deck is 12 feet above the cement apron. 12 feet does not seem like a high enough place to jump off of if you're trying to kill yourself. No, I think that it's just she's a good person and her brain doesn't go to homicide. Yeah, she was just kind of confused about what was going on. But in any case, the police arrived knowing that this was maybe more than just an accident. There might be a human will at play here. Meanwhile, Lynn noted two broken candle stubs and some broken glass down by the water. So it appears that the candles had gone over as well at some point. And the quilt is also there. And it's also on the pavement while Flo's body is in the water. And so he instinctively picked up the quilt, which was wet. And when he picked it up, there was a puddle of pink water underneath it. What's the pink water? It's blood in the water. Okay. Yep. And at that point, he's like, oh, shit, I shouldn't have touched the quilt. Because he's panicking, too. And then he's like, oh, God, and I haven't told Mark what happened to his wife. You could not see where Lynn was standing when he was looking at Flo from Mark's cabin. It was a, like a fair distance away, enough that you wouldn't be able to see the person standing down there where he was looking into the water. And so he starts walking up to the cabin, and he has to walk on this little path. And he is getting almost to the cabin. He's on the path when Mark comes running down. And you still, you can see the boathouse, but you can't see Flo even remotely. And he says, Mark, you're not going to like it, but she's in the water. So Mark started screaming at this point, like he's losing it. And that's when Dory opened her window to see what was going on. She opened her blinds and she saw Lynn speaking to Mark who was losing it. And then all of a sudden Mark took off running and he ran directly to where Flo was in the water. But there was no way he could have known where she was. You cannot see her from here. In fact, they show on the forensic files, they had like a dummy of her size that you can't see Flo's body until you are almost standing directly above her. You would have to be on the deck or right on the concrete apron looking down. But he knew exactly where to run. He knew exactly where to go, even though Lynn didn't say anything. It's just like your brain. Like you can't undo. You can't unknow where you put your dead wife. No. So Lynn obviously let Mark go and have a moment. And when he came down finally, Mark was wet and he was sitting near Flo's body, but Flo was still in the water. And Mark said that he had tried to lift Flo out of the water, who was very clearly deceased. She was actually already stiffening from rigor mortis. But when he lifted her, he said that blood had flowed out of her nose and mouth. And it freaked him out. So he just dropped her back in the water. Mm. Which Lynn also thought was very odd. That like usually people who are grieving, even if it doesn't make sense, they're trying to get their loved ones out of the water. Even if it's clearly you wouldn't leave the person you love floating in water. You wouldn't redrop them back in the water. Yeah. The EMTs arrived and they realized immediately that Flo was dead and that something was just not right at this scene. 
Mark was gently told to gather himself and figure out a way to tell his children what was going on. Plus, he was told to call Flo's family. (sighs) So Flo's dad is on the forensic files, and he's amazing. But Flo's mom, Claire, was the one who was originally answering the phone that morning. And she was also interviewed by Tom Henderson for his book. And Claire said that when the phone rang at their house at 845 in the morning, she knew as soon as she heard Mark's voice that something absolutely terrible had happened. Now, the kids called Flo's dad Papa. That's like their grandpa name for him. And Mark's like, I need to talk to Papa. I got to talk to Papa. And Claire's like, what happened? Where's my daughter? And he's like, put Papa on the phone. And she's like, Mark, where's my daughter? And he just kept saying, I want to talk to Papa. And she said, quote, my God, you've killed my daughter. It clicked in. She heard his voice and she was like, that unbelievable, incredibly sad, just awareness as a mother. It's unbelievable. Yep. So at that point, Harold took the phone from his wife and he's like, Mark, what happened? And he said later that Mark just kept saying, she's in the water. She's in the water. They were just astounded, which they immediately contacted Flo's divorce attorney and told her something was going on and that Flo was apparently deceased. And everyone, her attorney, Flo's parents, immediately suspected Mark of doing something terrible because... Wasn't even like he was defending himself on the phone with his father-in-law. No. He was just kept saying that she was in the water, which is nothing. There was another person that talked to him, too. That said that they straight up asked him, did you do something to her? And he was like, how could you think that? He doesn't say no. He said, how could you think that? He deflected rather than answering the question. The attorney actually went to the police in Detroit right away while the Stearns got up to Watervale so that they could find out what was going on. Mm. Yeah. And so back at Watervale, Mark had broken the horrible news to his poor children. And then he immediately started packing their stuff up. So the police have just arrived. His wife's body is still in the water and he is fully packing their SUV up. He's putting the dog in the car. He's telling the boys, pack your stuff up. It's time to go. So the the cops are like, you're not going anywhere. You're going to need to talk to us about what happened and where you've been and where your wife has been. So Mark said that he and Flo had been out on the boathouse deck talking around eight, just like Fred the witness had said. And then either Flo had told him to or he had decided to go back to the cottage to check on the kids who were alone watching a movie. Well, which one is it? I don't know which version of it. It might have been he decided, but then later it became like she told him or they mutually decided. I mean, at some point, somebody's got to go check on the kids. So it was like something like that. Like, oh, you know, we decided somebody had to go check on the kids. So he said that he went, he was talking to the kids. They put on another movie. And then when he came back out, Flo was gone. He said at that point, though, the light was on at the Duncan's cottage and Flo was relatively friendly with Maggie. So he thought that she had seen the Duncan's come home and she had gone into their cottage with them. So he decided to go back to his own cabin with the kids and they all fell asleep watching a movie. When he woke up the next morning, he called the Duncans to find her because she had never come home the night before. This is what he's telling the police. After this interview, Mark went into the cabin's kitchen where his kids were eating cereal with Dory and just in total shock, of course. And Dory would later say that one of the boys said, Daddy, my heart is broken. And Mark said, broken hearts mend, don't they, Dory? And she was like, what the actual fuck are you saying? She was like, dude, come on. These children minutes ago found out their mother is dead. And you're like, well, broken hearts mend. Don't worry about it. Okay. Pack up your Pack shit. yourself up. Let's go. Psycho. At 2.25 p.m. that day, forensic techs were already on the scene. I think because they said that – uh Harold was pretty connected. He was an attorney who was connected. He was like, yeah, we're going to get, we're going to need all the police up in here. Something's not right. So they were on the scene. They were on it already. They noted that one of the railings was fractured and there was a lot of white paint flecks, 
it looks like it had just been damaged and the railing was painted white. So it was flaking. Below on the cement apron, there was a very large blood stain. They also determined that the railing was pretty low. Apparently, Michigan State Code had changed after the boathouse was built. So the railing was much lower than what was currently Michigan State Code. So it's a low railing. So they're looking at all of this and they're thinking it's entirely possible that maybe she was wrapped in this quilt for warmth. It had been a very cold and rainy night. And then maybe she tried to sit or lean against the rail and it splintered and she went over because Lynn had been out on that deck hoisting the furniture, the heavy deck furniture with a rope over the side and lowering it down because he was storing it in the boathouse. So he had been out that very day and the railing hadn't been broken. So this break was definitely a new phenomenon. So they're like, maybe something happened and the railing broke and she just went over. But it doesn't explain how she got into the water. Because first of all, where the railing is to the blood stain doesn't exactly fit, like that theory. But also the blood stain was something like two to three feet away from where she was in the water. So it seems clear that she'd obviously fallen and she had laid in that spot for a while because the blood stain was fairly large. And then somehow she ended up in the water. So none of this is really making sense, even if you're trying to look at it like an accident. So how would she end up in the water? And did the fall kill her or had she drowned? So let's talk about the autopsy to find out. So the autopsy would go on to be a point of huge contention later on. So we're going to start with what is for sure and then how these findings were interpreted differently by different people. Three days after Flo's death, Dr. Stephen Cole conducted her first autopsy, and he found that Flo weighed 150 pounds, which was due, because he was weighing her with her wet clothes on, due to her wet clothes, and there was a lot of water in her body and in her lungs. So he estimated that she was about 135 pounds in normal life. And this is very interesting, too, and I just, I want to say this as an aside for all of you guys who listen to a lot of true crime podcasts or shows and hear these stories over and over again. Because on forensic files, it said that she weighed 110 pounds. But in the book, it said she was 135. And so when I was watching forensic files, I was like, I can't believe like forensic files said 110 pounds. But I don't know what is real. I mean, I feel like kind of betrayed. I'm like, if you can't trust forensic files, who can you trust? (laughs) Suffice to say, she did not weigh a lot. She was somewhere between like 110 and 135 pounds max. She's a very fit, very svelte woman. They found that Flo had zero drugs or alcohol in her system. Apparently, the only thing she had in her system was like some Advil. Okay. Just like a couple Advil. And there was water in her lungs, which could obviously indicate drowning. But Dr. Cole believed that she had actually died of a very bad skull fracture from the fall. He would record the death originally as craniocerebral trauma. Because there was also blood in the lungs. So she had been inhaling blood as it leaked into her nasal cavities, which led him to believe she'd been knocked out on the concrete before she got into the water. Does that make sense for the fall? This would be consistent with the big blood stain on the cement. So he's thinking that this is what killed her. What he can't say, because he's also not at the scene is how did she get from where the big blood stain is into the water? Now, later on, the defense would say that Flo had fallen off the deck, a tragic accident, because the deck was splintered. So there was evidence of a break and that she had obviously smashed her head on the concrete. No one was arguing that. And then she had either accidentally rolled into the water, maybe while she was struggling to live and was still reeling from the accident, or maybe she had a seizure that caused her body to move involuntarily into the water. So that is how the defense will interpret the first medical examiner's findings. Okay. Well, a team came up from Detroit to do their own autopsy and overlook the work that Dr. Cole had done, and they brought famed medical examiner Lubisa Dragovic, whom we have totally talked about in a previous Michigan case, even though I can't remember which one right now. 
they tested the heck out of the railings. So they wanted to see if that was a feasible conclusion. That somehow she leaned against it. Now, the deck was pretty old. It looked like, you know, if with enough force, you could probably break one of those railings. Obviously, one was broken. This is on the, the forensic files as well. They basically did some studies where they ended up, like, putting pressure on the railings and seeing how much a human being would have to weigh to be able to accidentally break it. So it's not somebody, like, purposely trying to break it. Like, how much force would have to be on it? Just somebody leaning. True physics. Yes. And they determined that a person would have to be 200 pounds or over in order to be able to break that railing. Now, we know she is somewhere between 110 and 135 pounds. So that's not possible. Absolutely not possible that she just leaned against it and it broke. Furthermore, Dr. Dragovic also went over the autopsy findings with Dr. Cole in his lab. So he looked at every slide, every photo, every organ sample, and they had maintained her brain too. And they had like put it in this like freezing process so that you could better slice it to see what was going on in the brain after the damage, which was really interesting too, because her, we know she was alive for a little while after the fall because there was already evidence of her brain trying to heal the trauma. Crazy. So it was enough time. She hadn't died yet because there was evidence that her brain was trying to fix the damage. Her bodies are incredible. Insane. So Dragovich is looking at this and he's like, no, 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 no. Yes, she had this terrible, absolutely life-threatening head injury. But what really killed her was the drowning. He explained that the head injury was a proximate cause of death because it would have definitely killed her eventually. But drowning was the immediate cause of death. So until now, Dr. Cole had not officially ruled that Flo's death was a homicide. This had been a, a few months that he just put pending under what had killed her other than knowing that, in his opinion, it was the cerebral hemorrhage. Yeah. He had not made a ruling on whether it was a homicide or not. But Dragovic argued that it could only be a homicide. There's one very clear reason. Flo could not have gotten herself almost three feet away into the water on her own with the type of head injury she had. There's no way. She also, if she fell the way where the head injury was, how did she like get herself turned over so she was face down in the water? He's like, it doesn't make sense. There's just no way that this was possible. Somebody had to purposely, physically put her face down in the water. Yeah. Well, Dr. Cole reluctantly made the ruling that Flo's death was a homicide, but he said, quote, if I was on a jury based on my findings alone, it would have been very hard to say this is a murder. This guy has to go to prison. So he wasn't entirely sure, but he said it was worth ruling as a homicide because he was 51% sure it was a homicide. So that's the original medical examiner. Well, Dr. Dragovic was like, I am 100% sure this is a homicide. So another reason the defense would later refute the dragged into the water theory was that there wasn't abrasions on Flo's body that were indicative of being dragged on cement. Okay. But I saw the crime scene photos and Flo was wearing a long sleeve fleece and long pants. She also may have had the quilt around her, which had pink bloody water on it, or... I don't think that Fred recalled seeing her wrapped in a quilt when they were chatting. So it's also entirely possible that the killer brought the quilt to the situation to roll her onto and then pull her into the water. All of those things together would make sense of why there wasn't dragging abrasions on her skin. Totally. She's bundled up. It's October 24th. And I feel like also if you're wearing fleece and pants, like that would even be an extra layer. Yeah. Exactly. So now, obviously, they have a suspect, Mark. They have an idea of how she was killed, but the when and why, they don't know. By all accounts, Mark was still desperately in love with Flo and optimistic about reconciliation. Interviewing loved ones and a tiny little piece of forensic evidence would really bring this whole picture together. Another person, other than Flo's parents, who was quite sure of Mark's guilt right away, was a man named Glenn Stark. Now, Glenn was actually Mark's best friend. Which seems strange that Mark's best friend would be so convinced of his guilt. 
Glenn and his wife had been best friends with the Ungers for five years. They had all lived in Huntington Woods together. Very frequently they socialized. Though the Starks had semi-recently moved to Montana, they had all stayed in close contact. Well, Glenn testified in a preliminary hearing that after Flo told Mark she wanted a divorce, he began acting erratically. He was getting furiously angry at the drop of the hat, out of the blue, that wasn't his typical style. Mark had also told Glenn that he refused, straight up refused, to imagine a life without Florence. He said he loved her too much and he would not let her go. Glenn had tried many times to get Mark to move on from Flo, but he would not do it. He was saying, let's talk about what your life is going to look like after this divorce and try to have a positive relationship with Flo for your kid's sake. And Mark straight up said, it's not happening. I don't know what to tell you, Glenn. So Glenn Stark was just being a good friend, trying to help Mark process his divorce in a healthy manner, right? Yep. Maybe. But that wasn't his only motivation. It was revealed that Flo had been having an affair with Glenn, Mark's best friend, for two years before her murder. (laughs) And he is shocked. Does his wife know? She did not know until the day that Flo was found deceased. That was the day he told her. No one knew about this. It was apparently, and Glenn called it this, the best kept secret in Huntington Woods. The affair had started when Flo was beside herself with Mark being out all night drinking, doing drugs, gambling. Obviously, she would call his best friend to try to figure out where he was, what he was doing. Do you know where he is? Is he with you? And one thing led to another, and no one really like knows exactly how this started other than Glenn, obviously, but it started with some sort of camaraderie about dealing with everything that Mark's addiction was putting his loved ones through. Obviously, yep. they were talking about doing the intervention and ostensibly it started as caring for Mark and then they started to lean on each other more and more and one thing led to another. And no one knew about it. Flo didn't tell anyone in her life, not her best friend. Did Mark know? So Glenn said he didn't believe that Mark knew. He didn't believe that anyone knew. If it wasn't for Glenn coming clean to the prosecutor, no one would have ever known. So the prosecutor had noticed intimate emails because he's just digging through. And she, there was a great female prosecutor. They were digging through all of her emails and they weren't intimate, like physically intimate or like sexy pictures or anything. It was just a way of speaking to each other that seemed like something was there. that There was something more there. There was a closeness and a familiarity that was so evident in these emails that they ended up calling Glenn, who was at that time living in Montana. And during their very first conversation, apparently Glenn said, just be straight with me. Just ask me the question. And they asked him, were you having an affair with Flo? And he said, yes. So this had been going on for two years, but it definitely seems like it was more of an emotional affair than a physical Because Glenn was very honest with the prosecutors, and he said in the two years that they were having an affair, they only had sex four times. Yeah, so it's like barely an affair. (laughs) It's barely an affair. It's really interesting. It's like four one-night stands with like emotional support. Yeah, and it just seems like it must have tipped over into sex a handful of times when they were hanging out together. Because to me, four times over two years doesn't strike me as some sort of torrid affair. No. You get four times in one night when you're having a torrid affair. (laughs) At like a seedy motel. Yeah, exactly. Got to get it in while you can. So this is definitely, I would say, more of an emotional type affair. But the last time that they had sex was on the 17th of October, exactly one week before Flo got murdered. So did he know? Did he find out somehow? With this information, as well as the forensic evidence, the police and prosecutors began to piece together what they believed happened the night Florence Unger was killed. So they believed that Mark and Flo were on the deck talking around 8 p.m. when the witness, Fred, saw them and started chatting with them. He mistakenly believed that it was a romantic interlude based on the candle, but it is more likely that Flo, who was deathly afraid of the dark, had insisted upon the candles because the light was out. In fact, 
Like we talked about, she even mentioned to Fred that she was terribly afraid of the dark. Now, why then were Flo and Mark out in the dark on the deck instead of in the cabin with their family, which was far enough away that you can't really see them? After all, they had a 7 and a 10-year-old. Well, the 10-year-old would later say that they had an argument at dinner. The whole point of this trip, at least for Flo, was to show family unity. She doesn't want the kids to see them fighting. That's the last thing she wants. They believed that Flo and Mark put on the movie for the kids and then popped out so that they could have a private discussion on the deck without the kids hearing. At that point, they were interrupted by Fred, who then moved on and they continued talking. Maybe they were fighting. The prosecution would later suggest that maybe Mark made a move on Flo. Like maybe he like was like wanted to hold her. Maybe he stressed his desire to reconcile. And at that point, she recoiled from him. And they even think that maybe somehow either she revealed the affair. Maybe he revealed he suspected the affair. Maybe he even just said, what is there somebody else? Like if I'm not touching you, who is? Maybe it come out and he realized that she was having an affair with his best friend. But I don't even think the affair had to come up. I don't necessarily know whether Mark knew or not. He would later say that he absolutely did not know and he wouldn't find out until the criminal proceedings against him. But that works in his favor. He has to say he didn't know because that takes away a motive. I don't think it matters almost because I can see him, her just saying, no, Mark, absolutely not. We're not reconciling. I will never be your wife again. I never want to touch you. I never want to have sex with you ever again. Would be maybe enough to make him fly off the handle, and push her off the deck. Yeah, I think so too. So either scenario, either he finds out about the affair and confirms it, or he actually doesn't know about the affair, but still, she must have made it pretty clear that they were never, ever, ever getting back together, as Taylor Swift would say. They posit that he pushed her over the rail. She falls, hits her head. He thinks she's dead. But also, depending on the timeline, there might be some activity. Maybe the Duncans are getting home. Think about it. They got home at 9.15. Stuff is going down. So he thinks she's dead. She's definitely knocked out. So she's quiet and nobody can see this area. It's in the dark and nobody can see it from their home anyway. So he goes back to the cabin where the kids are. The kids say he came back alone, not with their mother. And he basically tucked them in. He talked to them for a little while. Then he goes, oh, I have to go out and do something or check on something. Mark would later tell the police this is when he went back out to go look for Flo. And that's when he saw the light on at the Duncans and just assumed she was with him. That's what his story is. Well, they think that that's obviously not what happened. They think that he killed his wife, but then he realized there was other people coming and going. So he waited Until after Dory was done walking her dog at 10 p.m., everyone's back inside their cabins, closing down, their lights are coming off for the evening, everyone's shut down. And then he crept back out, realized that Flo was still breathing, that she was still alive. And then he pulled her into the water and placed her face down to ensure that she would be killed. Dr. Dragovic said this was absolutely based on the forensic evidence, the correct theory, based on the size of the blood stain and the evidence in the brain of how long the brain had been trying to repair itself. It seemed that she had likely been lying on the cement, unconscious and bleeding for at least 90 minutes. Oh my God. Before she was put cruelly into the water in the dark. So this is all happening, like I said, when he claims he was looking for her and assumed she was with the Duncans. Now, this whole thing is asinine, obviously, because he knows his wife is afraid of the dark. So this whole setup is ridiculous. She would be the one who said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to be with the kids. She wouldn't say, I'm going to hang out on the black deck alone by myself while you go check on the kids. So that's insane to begin with. But the other thing that's insane is that he would just walk out, see a light on at someone's house, be like, guess she must be there, and then not wake up for the rest of the night and wonder where she was and call them in the middle of the night. I'm sorry if I was having any sort of issue with my spouse, even if I wasn't, 
And I knew that they were very afraid of the dark to the point where they couldn't walk from their car to the front door. I wouldn't just go to bed with my kids. I'd be calling them, calling the proprietors, trying to figure out where they were. I'd be out with a flashlight looking for them. Absolutely. She had no history of sleeping over at the Duncans. In fact, the kids said that they had already picked out rooms. They were sleeping in separate rooms in this cottage already. So she wasn't in her room when they woke up, the boys said. So shady. It's so shady. I just can't imagine a world in which a partner wouldn't go out looking for a partner, especially one that's supposed to be scared of the dark. Because why didn't she need somebody to walk her from the Duncans back to their cottage then? The prosecutors then believed that Mark, either the first time or the second time he was out there when he was putting her in the water, decided to try to make Flo's murder look like an accident. So he kicked one of the deck railings until it splintered. And that's why it was broken. And how do they know this? Is there shit on his shoe? Uh Yeah. The forensic techs found white specks on his sneakers that were an exact match for the paint on the railing. Add to that the possibility he knew about the affair, the potential loss of custody of his children, a $750,000 life insurance policy on flow, which is more like a cool $1.25 million today. And we've got motive, means, and a whole lot of forensic evidence. After she rejected him, Flo was absolutely worth way more dead than alive to Mark Unger. Absolutely. In May of 2004, seven months after Florence's death, Mark was arrested for her murder. Sons Max and Tyler went to live with Flo's parents, the loving grandparents, the Stearns. Mark's trial began in May of 2006. His mother did hire him a damn good defense attorney. I'm sure. The best of the best. He was so expensive and, oh, guys, don't quote me on this, but it was something absurd. Like he had only ever lost two out of a hundred cases he tried. I mean, that sounds right. That sounds like the exact person that mama would hire. Exactly. So she's taking care of her baby, which I totally understand. Like, when you have kids, you love them so much. All you want to do is believe them, even if it's beyond belief, and take care of them. So while the prosecutor is arguing essentially the scenario that I just described to you guys, the defense was arguing that it was simply a horrible accident due to the aging and not up to code boathouse deck railing. It's the boat's fault now. It's the Duncan's fault for being the proprietors of this crumbling resort that allowed a beautiful woman to die because of their dirty, low, broken, mold-filled railings. To counter the prosecution's assertion that forensically there was just no way that Flo could have moved herself into the water, they had an expert engineering witness from MIT create animations that showed various ways that Flo could have fallen and somehow through the miracle of science, ended up in the water. The problem was that this guy was an expert in how objects fall, how general objects fall, not human bodies. As Dr. Dragovic says on the forensic files, human bodies do not bounce. No. So none of these scenarios that that he created, they were like full on like cartoons. (laughs) At one point, the, the judge described it has like a a flip book. He's like, yeah, it's like one of those, uh, you know, those books where you like do the pages really fast and like Tweety Bird takes off their hat or something. <laughs> Guys. Tom Hederson wrote something like a line that was like if somebody had just pulled that out of like a court documentation, a transcript, they would be like, really? That was said in a murder trial? But yeah, these animations just didn't seem feasible knowing what Dr. Dragovic knew about the human body. And... At one point, even, like, the animations had confused her arm with her leg. It was just, like, the prosecution pointed out. They're like, well, what's this? And what's that? And the guy was like, oh, I guess I must have reversed her arm and leg. And they were like, okay, come on. Come on. Mr. MIT. Yes, Mr. MIT, retired MIT. The jury didn't like that guy, too. They thought he was very pompous. Mm. Later, we get some tea from the jury. They did not like that, dude. They liked Lubisa Dragovich, who made a fine figure on the stand. This was actually a big battle between expert witnesses. Obviously, the defense has a lot of money. They're throwing all of their expert witnesses, saying the opposite of what the prosecution's expert witnesses are. 
And oh man, it was like fireworks. Like they were the defense attorney hated Dr. Dragovic and was like so trying not to get his testimony in. And the judge was like, no, I'm gonna let it in. It was like a whole fight. Like, I mean, Tom Henderson put a lot of the trial in this book because there was like a lot of egos between the attorneys and the expert witnesses and everyone. So there's like a lot of fighting during this trial. They also did that thing I hate defense attorneys do. They painted Flo as an unfaithful, money-hungry shopaholic who was leaving Mark because his $10,000 a month in disability wasn't good enough for her. Yeah, that's low. I don't even know what the point of doing that is, though, because you're saying that it was an accident. So why would you demean the victim of an accident? Yeah, it's weird. It's like he did this whole closing statement where he's like, of course, I don't want to like say bad things about this woman, but she's not perfect. She's not the picture perfect woman they're describing. She was somebody who overspent, who wanted to stay at home with her kids while not lifting a finger. Like they were, it was very rude. Very, very rude. The prosecutor introduced all of the forensic evidence we've talked about, as well as witnesses that testified to the state of the Unger's marriage and Mark's feelings about it. And Glenn Stark also testified. They also raised a question that highlighted the central flaw of the defense's theory. Flo had a very well-documented extreme fear of the dark. What are the chances she would, like I said already, send Mark back to check on the kids while she herself stayed alone in the dark in the middle of the Michigan woods? No. At a basically empty resort. Not bloody likely. She literally said it to someone 20 minutes before she died. Yeah. And in the bizarre event that she did that, would her husband who knows that she's terrified of the dark upon not finding her outside, just shrug a shoulder and go, well, I guess I'll just go to bed. She'll find her way home. Literally, Glenn Stark, one of the first things he said to Mark when they talked on the phone was, you were letting her walk around in the dark by herself. He's like, why would she be? She would never be outside by herself. You were like letting her just, she'd be terrified. It sounded like if you knew Flo, then you knew that this story just did not make sense. Yep. The judge told the jury that they could find Mark guilty of first-degree murder, second-degree murder, or, of course, they could acquit him on all charges. After 26 hours of deliberation, the jury did return a guilty verdict. Now, Andy, do you think they did first or second degree? First. You are correct. Now, everyone else was surprised about first degree, even the prosecutor. She said that... Given the fact that even the prosecution was presenting it as kind of a crime of passion, that there was a fight on the deck and some sort of scuffle occurred, they had been gunning for first degree because their point was premeditation was when he put her in the water. That was when he decided to kill her. So that counts as premeditation, even if the original injury was not premeditated. She was not entirely sure if the jury was going to believe that. So she was... Like, okay, crossing her fingers for second degree, pretty much expecting second degree. And she was elated that they went first degree. Now, what's interesting is that the jury foreman actually wrote a letter explaining how they felt about the various expert witnesses, what they thought happened. And they actually thought that it was completely premeditated. Like, even him inviting her up was premeditated. I think so, too. That blows my mind because I was totally on board with the fight of passion. I think the things that he said to Glenn even, like, that's not happening. Like, that planted the seed of… Do you think he knew about Glenn? I don't know. I mean, I feel like the fact that they had sex a week before, I feel like it was easy when he was at rehab. Yeah, that timing was very suspicious to me that… They had sex a week before. And I think she had gone to Montana or something. So he would have known she was away. And I definitely think this guy's got a lot of time on his hands. He doesn't work. He's making all that disability money. He just like works out and goes to therapy every once in a while. He's got a lot of time to figure out how to hack into her email. And if some random stranger, a prosecutor, figured out these emails were intimate, then I think that the man who was best friends with the guy and... Husband of the woman. Yep, would figure out that they were also intimate. So they said that. They also said that, honestly, they didn't really care that Flo was afraid of the dark. Well, the prosecution thought this was a big deal. Obviously, Tom Henderson named his book Afraid of the Dark. They said, and I quote, everyone in northern Michigan knows that you would never stay out in the rain on a windy late October night. No. (laughs) 
<laughs> so that's common sense for the win. Well, under Michigan law, if you are convicted of first degree murder, you are automatically awarded a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole. We got an LWAP. So Mark has since appealed, but to no success. So he remains a guest of the state at the Chippewa Correctional Facility on Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Sons Max and Tyler remained in their grandparents' care and in 2006 won a $10 million lawsuit against their father. Wow. For Florence's projected lifetime earnings as a bank loan officer and personal loss to her survivors, of course. So it's unclear how much of that $10 million they got, but I think it was based on the life insurance policies and his disability insurance that, remember, he was supposed to get till he was 65. So I do think that they did get a good chunk of change. But it also set a precedent, which showed that the boys believed that their father killed their mother if they went through with that lawsuit. According to an article on ForensicFilesNow.com, both boys grew into successful men. Max earned his MBA from University of Michigan and has a management job with Spurs Sports and Entertainment, and Tyler followed in his mother's footsteps to a career in design. Cute. Flo's father finished the Forensic Files episode with a heartbreaking and very heartfelt plea to support your loved ones who are going through a divorce. If you or someone you care about is getting divorced, he said to please have them avoid contact with their estranged spouse even if there is no prior history of physical violence and even if your attorney says it's a good idea. He said even casual contact can become a dangerous and life-threatening event. He's not wrong. This could have all been avoided if Flo hadn't gone up with him, but she had no reason to believe he'd hurt her. So take care of yourself if you are going through this. Be wary and take care of your girls. Take care of the people in your life who are going through a divorce because it's always right when the person is getting out from under the thumb of their spouse that they're at their most vulnerable. Well, I think that's a pretty good one to kick off our in conclusion. In conclusion, take care of yourself and the people you love, especially if they're going through a divorce. Absolutely. And as we've learned from now a couple of Michigan cases, don't fuck with Lubisa Dragovic. I mean, he will come for you. Do not. <laughs> he will. He's fierce. You guys should watch him on the Forensic Files. I love him. He was like really funny on, I think, a different Forensic Files too. And as always, trust your gut when it comes to love so no one ends up murdered. Love y'all. I hope you had a great holiday weekend. 